Welcome to our Fujifilm Healthcare webinar organized in occasion of the ISO Congress 2021. Thank you very much for joining. This is one of our educational activities that we arrange for this Congress. My name is Luca Mastrogirolamo. I'm European Clinical Support Manager for Fujifilm Healthcare in Europe, and I will be your facilitator for this event. Today, we are very pleased to have as a panelist of this webinar, Professor Julien Carvalho from Royal Brompton and St. George's Hospital in London, UK. Professor Carvalho is a well-known fetal cardiologist. She works close to obstetrics and uh, fetal medicine specialists to improve scanning of the fetal heart. And she's also known for uh, international courses uh, to train and improve the recognition of congenital heart diseases and show how to get better results. Today, uh, she will present us a lecture with the title Ultrasound in Aortic Arch Anomalies. You can place your question to Professor Carvalho on the chat of, of this platform. We will be very happy to submit them to our panelists. So uh, I think we can start. I'm pleased to introduce Professor Carvalho. Thank you for, very much for joining. The floor now is yours. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Luca, very much for the kind introduction and also to thank Fujifilm for asking me to contribute to this educational webinar. Uh, and I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon to the delegates that are attending and taking the time to watch this session uh, whenever you have the time, morning or afternoon. I was asked to talk about ultrasound in aortic arch anomalies, uh, and it's a pleasure to do that. I'm going to concentrate on the what we prefer to call arch view, which is the three vessel and trachea view, which is really only a small part of the cardiac screening views as shown here on this diagram from the ISO guidelines. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we will not have checked all the other structures, but I'm gonna expand on the three vessel trachea view and go beyond that to talk about arch anomalies. So the outline of this presentation is going to be first to understand what aortic arch laterality is and concentrate on the normal left arch because we need to know the normal before we recognize the abnormal. And then I'll talk about the right aortic arch followed by a double aortic arch. So to start with, uh, to understand aortic arch laterality, I'm gonna take you back to very early in the pregnancy on this hypothetical model by Jess Edwards, where we all have two arches uh, in the embryonic phase. And then subsequently, one of the arches will disappear. And normally the right arch disappears, giving uh, a normal left arch to the majority of people. Contrary to that, in a smaller proportion, and we are knowing now that it's not that uncommon, part of the left arch disappears, and then we are left with a dominant right arch. But we're here to talk about ultrasound, so let's leave aside the embryology and try and find a better way of defining laterality that can apply to scanning the fetus or to the child. And the definition of laterality, arch laterality, is referring to which bronchus is crossed by the aortic arch. So a left arch crosses the left bronchus, bronchus and is to the left of the trachea. So a key point of reference here is the trachea as it is as well in the child postnatal on the chest X-ray. And the right arch, it crosses the right bronchus and is to the right side of the trachea. And why this, is this a good point of reference? Because we know that in the fetus, the trachea is fluid field and therefore it shows very nicely on the ultrasound. So I'm gonna start with a, a very quick reminder, which I'm sure you are all aware of, of the basics of the three vessel view, because we need to move upwards from there to start recognizing the arch abnormalities. So in here we have the three vessels, pulmonary aorta and superior vena cava, and we need to check their number, size, arrangement, and alignment. And I put a very short clip, which shows you very briefly a sweep between the left ventricular outflow tract and the three vessel view. We must remember that all of these structures are very close together. 
So if the baby jumps, we may get the remainder of the view, which is the three vessel and trachea view. From this image alone, we only see that the aorta is here in the middle. Uh, we don't see the whole aortic arch, so it could easily go on to the right. Uh, so we do need to go further into the three vessel, three vessel trachea view. As in this slide, and I've also added color, so we have here the pulmonary artery forming the ductal arch, the aorta uh, and its entire transverse arch going to the left of the trachea. So both arches are to the left of the trachea, which forms the classical V shape that we all used to and looking for during the anomaly screening. If we don't see that V-shape, we must suspect either the vessel is missing or is in a different position or is perhaps to the right of the trachea. So I'm going to use a few of these diagrams to try and explain a bit more about the branching pattern of the aorta and to explain about right and left arch and double arch. So this is the usual pattern of bifurcation of the vessels or ramifications of the vessels from the left side of the aortic arch. And with the ultrasound, in terms of the cross-sectional views, we are cutting across the vessels higher up from the transverse aortic arch. Uh, and then we see the first branch of the aorta in the left arch, the right brachiocephalic, which subsequently divides into the right subclavian artery and right common carotid. The second branch is the left common carotid, and the third branch is the left subclavian artery. So this is the usual pattern. And let's explore this a bit more by moving upwards, sweeping upwards from the three vessel trachea view. And we're going to see details of the innominate vein, the subclavian arteries, and the thymus initially in the normal fetus. So here is a little bit more superior from the three vessel trachea view. We can still see here the aortic arch, but we are now seeing the innominate vein, which normally runs above the level of the transverse arch. That's the trachea clearly seen in this fetus. We just see a little bit of a flashing here of some vessels which surround the thymus, and these are the subclavian arteries, which will become very handy. So I take it back, the internal memory arteries, which uh, originate from the subclavian arteries, and they delineate the thymus. This is a similar picture, but showing the internal memory arteries much more clearly. Uh, and this has been described as a thigh box, which uh, is basically where the thymus is. Again, will be an important uh, structure for us to try and visualize in case of arch abnormalities. And we see here as well, the arteries coming to the right and to the left, the left uh, subclavian artery and the right just a little bit coming on that side. But if we want to see them in more details, we really need to concentrate, adjust the gains. So here we can see more the first branch going here, turning around and it's gonna go into the right arm. And in here we see the left subclavian, a little bit of the left common carotid. So there are different ways of showing uh, these vessels. And here, concentrating a different view, we see the entire course of the first branch of the aorta in a left aortic artery, which will be the right brachiocephalic artery, and then dividing to the right subclavian, which will run along the right arm. That's the still image of the same. So it's a normal right subclavian artery. But we hear a lot about ASA these days and the anomalous origin of the right subclavian artery, which originates from the descending aorta and courses behind the trachea and the esophagus and runs down to the right arm. So this is a very common abnormality and most uh, detected more and more frequently these days because uh, all the obstetrician, the sonographers are becoming very good at using color, particularly in the first trimester, looking for markers of chromosome abnormalities. And this is a, a uh, ultrasound representation of the abnormal subclavian artery, abnormal origin of the subclavian artery. Here we see the trachea, the left duct, the aortic arch. We see a little bit of the subclavian giving rise to the internal memory, and that is the abnormal uh, right subclavian artery. So very typically, a uh, very characteristic image. Now, does it matter? 
Uh, and I think there's a lot of debate about that. Uh, I think that uh, it's important to determine that the subclavian artery has an anomalous origin as an isolated finding. And we can only be sure that it's isolated if we actually check the heart structures and we check the extracardiac structures in more detail. So I refer you to this uh, more or less recent paper uh, published in UOG, which has a relatively large series plus a, a meta-analysis of uh, the validity or the use utility of doing microarray in cases uh, should add here of isolated fetal aberrant right subclavian artery. And basically says it does not increase the risk provided it's isolated uh, in relation to the background risk of the population, but it should be seen as a marker. So therefore we should look at the rest of the fetus cardiac and extracardiac structures in more detail before saying it's isolated. So that takes us to the right aortic arch, how to recognize that and what does it mean? Does it form a vascular ring or not? So we've gone through the left arch and here is a picture of uh, a right arch. And I think it's important to realize that the left arch doesn't simply move towards the right side of the fetus, it flips over. So what we see in a right arch is a mirror image of the branching pattern that we see in the left arch. So therefore, the first branch here is the left brachiocephalic, which then divides into the left subclavian artery and the left common carotid, followed by the right common carotid and the right subclavian artery. So this is classically, if you have a right arch, providing the arterial duct stays on the left, it gives a very well-described U-shape as opposed to a V-shape. So if you see that, you know you have a right aortic arch, uh, but we'll come back to see other things that we need to bear in mind as well. So does it form a vascular ring? Does it matter in terms of clinical management? Of course, there is a management to see, is this associated with a, a chromosomal abnormality? Is this associated with extracardiac abnormality? But from the cardiac point of view, does it form a vascular ring? And the answer is, well, it depends. It depends on what? It depends on where the subclavian artery originates from. So not all right aortic arteries will form a vascular ring. So if we have a normal origin of the left subclavian artery as seen on this slide, so we have the right aortic arch, the subclavian coming here, and that's the right subclavian going to the other side, it does not constitute a vascular ring, but it's also much less common. The majority of cases we see with a right arch and a left duct will have, like in this case, an anomalous origin of the left subclavian artery. So here's the trachea. You know already about the nominate vein. You know already about the internal mammaries delineated in the thymus. And why am I highlighting this? Because if a baby has a uh, right aortic arch, we do discuss 22Q11 as a potential chromosome abnormality or Down syndrome as well or the abnormalities. So having seen the thymus is reassuring that the risk of 22Q microdeletion in this case is quite low. So it's another way of managing your pregnancy as well. And here's the left subclavian artery running towards the, the left arm. So this constitutes a vascular ring, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will have symptoms. This is another shot from a different baby, uh, basically demonstrating a sweep between the ductal arch, the right arch, the nominate vein, and on the back here, behind the trachea, we have the subclavian artery, quite clearly shown. Sometimes you have to look for them very carefully. They're not always uh, as easy to demonstrate, so but you do need to look for them in order to counsel the family appropriately as to the possibility that the baby may or may not have symptoms. So as I said, this forms a vascular ring. So another possibility for a right arch is that the left, uh, the arterial duct does not stay on the right, on the left. It also flips over to the right. So we have both the aortic arch and the arterial duct, the aortic arch and the arterial duct onto the right of the trachea. So you would not have a U-shape, even if you have a right aortic arch, when the arterial duct also goes to the right. 
And in these cases, it does not constitute a vascular ring, and it does not matter where the subclavian artery arises from. But in this case, sometimes there are other associated subnormalities, so it is still important to see that you can see the subclavian artery because just occasion can be isolated and originate from the duct itself. So just because it doesn't form a vascular ring does not mean it's not a problem. Uh, similarly, it can be associated with other cardiac abnormalities, like in this case, the baby had transposition with the pulmonary artery coming here from the left ventricle, the aorta from the right ventricle, the vessels in parallel with the right arch and the right duct uh, in the setting of complete transposition. It can occur as well in tetralogy of Fallon. So that has taken us to a uh, double aortic arch, which we thought was much less common uh, than it is. But again, we are recognizing a lot of the double arch antenatally because uh, of the good screening of the obstetricians and sonographers are doing, they are picked up much more frequently than they used to. And in this picture here, we see uh, that both arches, usually the right is dominant, but the left can be of reasonable size or sometimes almost the same size as the right. Uh, and in these cases, each arch will give rise to two of the vessels separately, the right subclave and right common carotid from the right arch and the left subclave and the left common carotid from the left arch. All cases of double aortic arch will form a vascular ring. As you can see here, they encircle the trachea. It doesn't matter where the, the duct is, which is usually on the left. But very important to remember and to realize that not all left arch and a double arch will be as juicy and as easy to see as this one. It can be quite small. It can be atretic. So in that case, you will not see with the ultrasound. So we have to be very careful to try and see any small vestigious parts of the left arch here uh, because it can simulate uh, an isolated right arch. So this picture here, the two arches are of similar size. This is right, this is left. So we have the SVC, the right arch. And as we play, we can see here that the left arch is very similar in size to the right arch. And we have the duct here to the left. So you have like a trident shape here for a double aortic arch. Very easy to show those when they are of similar size. Not the case when the right arch is very dominant and the left arch can be quite small. And as I said, in some cases, nearly atretic. So you really need to actively look for a second arch when you see a right arch. Like we start here with what seems to be a right arch and a left duct, but as we scan upwards, we can see that there is another arch coming here. Maybe I will stop that just momentarily. You can see here the left duct, the right arch, and there's a smaller left arch joining here which if you don't use color or if you don't pay, uh, pay attention and try and refine the image, you may not see a second smaller left arch. And that may be mistakenly diagnosed as, as a right arch as opposed to a double arch, which has different implications in terms of the clinical management of the children uh, after birth. So this is the same case seen from a different angle and using slightly different color, this is power Doppler. And you can see that, again, it's very important to look at the heart from all sorts of aspects. And in this case, although the spine is not in the best position, actually we see the uh, second left arch better from this view than in the view that I showed you before. Classically here, looking like the right arch, the left arch is the left pulmonary arch coming there. So very clearly a double aortic arch, left and right. So I like to put this image because I uh, like playing around with uh, the system and showing color in different ways. This resembles in a way uh, angiography postnatally. And I just chose here to do a double aortic arch starting at the level, cutting across here through the right and the left branches of the right and the left arch. And we have here the first branch left side, left common carotid, the left subclavian, which then runs to the left arm, the right common carotid, which is gonna to go to the head, 
the right subclavian artery, which then runs into the right arm. So it's quite a nice picture to show a cut around this level. Then if you play everything, you can see that's the same case as I shown before, a smaller left arch, a large arterial duct on the left, and a large right-sided dominant uh, aortic arch. So I come back to this image, mainly to remind you that we all have two uh, antenatally very early in the pregnancy, and then one of them is going to disappear and normally leaving one arch, but sometimes we still have the two arches present. Uh, and just to finalize, just to give you a little bit of data, uh, this has been updated a few years ago, but I can update you that uh, more recently, we see about 400 cases more or less a year uh, in our unit. And you can see there's a jump here in the number of right aortic arches and double aortic arches getting larger numbers as well from in the UK 2015, when we had the cardiac screening guidelines incorporating the three vessel trachea view, but the uh, ISWA guidelines were around here, 2013. So we are seeing that this is a relatively common abnormality, and that's why I chose this topic for today. Importantly as well is to realize that the vast majority of children that have a right aortic arch do not have symptoms postnatally, they are well, uh, and uh, very few of them, about 10%, maybe a bit more, uh, will, do, uh, will require surgery for the relief of the vascular ring. Uh, contrary to that, if you have a double aortic arch, uh, most children will have an intervention, but not all. So it's sometimes a dilemma, do we need to relieve that aortic arch? How long do we follow them? So guidelines for how to manage this now that we diagnose so many of these cases antenatally that would otherwise not be seen uh, can be quite challenging. So uh, policies for that are gonna come very soon. Um, and I think that comes to the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for uh, the interest on this uh, quite important subject and for attending this uh, webinar. I'll be happy to answer questions if you put them on the chat, on the chat and uh, uh, that will be passed on to me and I will uh, respond to them individually. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, dear Professor Carvalho, thank you very much for it this interesting lecture. It was really informative. You gave a lot of information about the ultrasound assessment of the aortic arch. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to remind to all the attendees that you can uh, place your question on the chat of this platform. We will be happy to submit them to Professor Carvalho for a reply. So I would like to thank you very much, all of you, for joining. And we look forward to seeing you all on the other Fujifilm Healthcare webinar that we organized for the ISOC Congress. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.